And I needed to go through it myself because what I question is, can you get underneath the root of the issue, especially if it's really traumatic from your past? While you're in a relationship, when you're talking about what's for dinner, what's for breakfast, where are we going on vacation, right? We haven't had sex in a week or, um, you know, there's so much that come up in relationships that could be, quote unquote, a distraction from authentic, deep healing. And I think if we depend on our partner to facilitate that healing for us or join us in that healing, it's almost not fair to me. So I'd love to get your thoughts because I know a lot of your the messages around relationships and your audience is interested in this. What do you think? Welcome back to the Challenger Podcast. I'm Dave Glazer in Denver, Colorado, wanting to welcome you to today's episode with our special guest, Robert Joseph. He is an author, speaker, and men's coach who joins us today to talk about the difference between isolation and solitude for men in the world today. He shares a very deep story about how he's taken five or six months straight of, of a period of solitude in a cabin in upstate New York. Understanding the difference between isolation and solitude for men today is so important because what men are facing in the world today that causes them to isolate are emotions that they're unable to understand and process. Those emotions could be fear, anger, sadness, shame. And when they feel those emotions, they tend to isolate. So when you have a loved one or a family member or a friend or a romantic partner that seems to be isolating, be sure to check in on them and their mental health. And we're going to give you some insight into how to do that on today's episode. Without further delay, let's welcome Robert Joseph. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm honored to be joined by my guest, Robert Joseph. How are you today, man? I'm great, Dave. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. It's my pleasure. Uh, we're getting to know each other a little bit better. You're in upstate New York now, but you, you're planning to move back to Brooklyn. Why is, uh, why is New York and Brooklyn part of your future? Well, I was born and raised in New York City, and uh, New York City has a culture, right? Just like any other state or any other country, really. And I think I just absorbed the, I absorbed the culture from a young age, but never the negative side of it, right? It's so easy to have New York City swallow you. Uh, I've always found my peace within the city. I was always adamant about carving out my peace. So it works for me. I find my balance there. However, <laughs> I have been nature deprived, which is why during the pandemic, I spent the last five months in complete solitude. So it wasn't just that I was nature deprived, but I went on an incredible inward journey. And the pandemic was a catalyst for that. And I decided to do it in solitude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, solitude, that word resonates with me. Um, I was uh, go, go, go through work and relationships up until March of last year. And as soon as that governor's order to shelter in place came down, I was put in a place I wasn't really comfortable with. And so after a couple or three days of wallowing in my own misery, I decided, you know, instead of thinking of this as isolation, I'm going to think of this as a period of solitude. Um, I was reading a book called Digital Minimalism at the time, and I felt like, okay, if, um, if Abraham Lincoln can regularly choose to do solitude, that was a story from the book, then I'd like to, I'd like to give that a shot. And what have you learned by choosing solitude in, in nature? My God, that's a great question. It's such a simple thing to do, right? Like just be with yourself. However, it's the worst punishment you could give the most heinous criminals, right? If you're in a cell, you'd rather, you'd rather be in a black, you'd rather be out with your life at risk, surrounded by mortal enemies than in a black hole by yourself, which is probably the safest place in a penal system, right? So it's scary. It's terrifying for most of us. And it was for me. But to answer your question, I learned so much, so much. And, and I'll tell you sort of conclusively what I've learned. M my mind has protected me for the 44 years of my life, right? And it's created stories and narratives to, pro to, to, to protect me from some things that happened to my body. And my body adjusted to my mind because my mind was the master, just like for most of us, the mind is the master until we learn. Well, when I went into solitude in nature, 
my mind started to slow down and eventually it started to shut down, not completely, but moments of shut down. My body woke up and my body said, we got some work to do. We need to release some stuff that you didn't know was here, but it's imprinted in your body. Let's get to work. And I released, for lack of a better term, demons on the top of mountains, stuff that was stuck within me, Dave, right? That like was holding me back from stepping into my greatest genuine power. Mm -hmm. That's what I learned from solitude. Quiet the mind, the body awakens, the body has the most intelligence. It is the authority if we allow it to be. And if we follow the sensations of the body, we'll make better decisions. Yeah, without a without question, that resonates with me. Uh, it reminds me of the book, The Body Keeps the Score. Mm. And the body can store trauma. It can store memories. It certainly stores information within its cells and DNA. Yeah, when the mind has time to slow down and not try to control so much, what I heard you describing in there was the ego trying to keep us safe of creating an explanation, a story, an outcome for a situation that's going to keep us safe. Mm -hmm. And we've evolved that way. Like it's, it's evolutionary biology at its core stuffed into the digital age where we're being bombarded by so much information. So um, I just spent a couple of days at my family's cabin in the mountains here in Colorado. And they, my parents have lived there full time for a year now. And I have seen their mental health improve, you know, just by listening to, way that, to the way that they talk, listening to the gratitude that they have for life. It comes from a lot of different places, but by them choosing solitude in the safest place that they could find that was accessible to them, they've made improvements in their life. And I got to experience that just for a couple of days. And God willing, I can do that for three or four or five months at some point in my life. It's on the list. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, nature is, is a homily, right? The word is you know, nature as we know it, but also human nature. I don't think that's a coincidence, right? What is that is within us and we must connect to it. And when we do, we awaken a part of ourselves that for many of us has been neglected and you're right. I mean, the appreciation, you know, when I hike up here, what I've started doing is speaking to myself out loud. It's very therapeutic for me. And I realize that's not, really me or it is me but it's my higher self and the message that i get over and over is this is for you this is yours this is a gift right climb the mountains swim the oceans travel the world see the exotic lands the deserts it's all for you you design what you want to do for this life but don't forget what's outside your door because if you can't get out of bed in the morning right that's okay suffering is a part of life but it's not meant to be permanent it's meant to be transient. And sometimes we forget. And after a while, that suffering becomes a little selfish. And we forget the gift that whether you believe in the universe, the source or God, something gave for us. And it happens automatically, right? Nature doesn't need us. It doesn't need us. We get wiped out tomorrow by another pandemic. The, the planet will continue, but we need it. We need it. And like your parents, when you step into it fully, you start realizing the benefits that it could give you. It's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Quiet the noise. That's right. It's, a, it's like a, a great analogy that can penetrate a lot of different areas of our life. And I can imagine how challenging it would be to quiet the noise in a place like New York City. And I can, I can acknowledge that I take for granted being so close to the mountains and nature here. Uh, in my 30 years in Colorado, the town has grown tenfold, at least. And so it's gotten a lot busier and a lot noisier. Mm -hmm. But if I take a week, you know, I've got a week planned in the mountains for June. That's my first vacation since, you know, uh, forever. I can't even remember my last vacation. Uh, a week planned in the mountains in June. And I'm like counting down the hours, the minutes, the days to, until I get back into nature in solitude, my, my family won't be there. Um, I've invited my partner and my daughter to come join me for two or three of those days. And I'll welcome both the solitude and the connection that we can have uh, as a small family unit while we're there. That's beautiful.
That's beautiful. And, and yeah, some people look at solitude and they go, you, we need each other, right? I, I, I made a message on Instagram about solitude and an ex-girlfriend reached out and said, you know, the Bible says this, we need each other, man needs woman. And I said, this isn't permanent. I'm not a hermit. <laughs> this is, this is temporary. And I'd love to get your thoughts on this because this is a realization I had yesterday. And this is just my opinion. We talk so much about healing in a relationship, right? Like we help each other heal. And I agree with that to a degree. What I've learned being up here is when you're in a relationship, I think the best that could come from it is there's a mirror that you can show to your partner or it's reflected. And that mirror shows you where you need to work mm -hmm. but after that it's if you sat there and said okay sweetheart now you're going to help me heal if, if i had a woman up in the cabin with me for the last five six months it wouldn't be good she'd probably run the hell out of the cabin it was dark and i needed to go through it myself because what i question is can you get underneath the root of the issue especially if it's really traumatic from your past while you're in a relationship, when you're talking about what's for dinner, what's for breakfast, where are we going on vacation, right? We haven't had sex in a week or, um, you know, there's so much that come up in relationships that could be, quote unquote, a distraction from authentic, deep healing. And I think if we depend on our partner to facilitate that healing for us or join us in that healing, it's almost not fair to me. So I'd love to get your thoughts because I know a lot of your the messages around relationships and your audience is interested in this. What do you think? That is a great question. And I know that we've got 45 minutes to dig in. We got plenty of time. All right. I'm, I'm checking my clock over here because I would love to spend an entire year discussing this. And, and you're right, you know, Harville Hendricks, the creator of Imago therapy, he says, we're born into, we're wounded in and we're healed in relationships. And I agree to your point that, only so far into our relationship can we even have the expectation that that other person's going to heal us because that brings on a conversation of codependency. Mm -hmm. So to back, to step back from the codependency conversation, which is the end result of expecting that from our partner, we have independence and we have interdependence and it relates to solitude versus isolation you're choosing solitude, you're not choosing isolation. So when somebody reaches out and questions, hey, why did you say that about solitude? Why did you say that about needing other people to heal? It's a great question to ask each other. And in solitude, we can find our independence. What do I need to rely on myself for? What, am, what is my greatest gift? How am I gonna give that to, to the world? And that is not related or dependent on anyone else. Okay, so how do I heal my relationship with myself? You can do that in solitude. And I feel as if like taking a break from dating is a, is a version of solitude. An opportunity to heal the relationship with yourself before you put that expectation onto somebody else. And to your point that a, a partner is a mirror, I'm seven months into my partnership and I could not agree more that Certainly, she supports me in a lot of areas of my life, and I support her in a lot of areas in her life, and that's interdependence for us. Where we, where we put up boundaries for our relationship in an agreement that we both decided upon, and we're always cultivating that, and we're always growing it, and we're always men, amending the boundaries and the, and the expectations in our relationship so that we can be mirrors for each other. And like when we get into conflict, it's like that immediately is a, an opportunity for me to look back at my own relationship with self. Why did that come up for me? What was coming up for me? And in those moments of reflection, <laughs> I don't want to do that in isolation, nor do I want to retreat from the safe container of the relationship that we've created so that I go into solitude again, because that's not what I've chosen to do. We have our own separate residences where we can go and have our independence and our solitude while in a relationship so that we can process and digest what just happened. But the healing that goes on in this relationship in a safe container for us, in my experience, has been 
how can I best support you mm -hmm. as you're receiving this reflection from me? What's coming up for you? You know, like we're watching, we're watching a commercial or something like that, or we're watching a, a, an emotional movie and I'll cry and she'll acknowledge that and she'll respect it. And she'll say, what came up for you during, while we were watching that? Or we're watching something more like a suspense thriller and I'll get really tight and I'll get really anxious. And for a moment, is that about me? Is that because I picked the movie? No, it's not about you. It's because I'm frustrated with the writing or the, or the climax of the movie. And we get to sit there and, and heal wounds through our experiences together. That yeah. movie was not about you. That movie brought up in me of like what I had created, that story. And I love that, I love that you started to go there of like the stories that we create are fill in the blank from years and years and years of, of our relationships teaching us one thing. And then when we find introspection and independence and a better relationship with ourselves, we, com we completely rewrite the script from that moment yeah. on. And How does that land with you? Oh, uh, lands amazingly. I mean, Jay Krishnamurti says it, right? He says, you know, all relationships are just a process of self-revelation. -revel That's it, right? They're, they're meant to, as you put it, what's coming up, okay. And what I learned, it took me a long time to learn this, is like, it's never about your partner. It's so easy to like end the relationship or be in a relationship and, and go tell your friends about how so much is wrong with your partner. And the relationship would be great if they were X, Y, or Z. And it's like, hold on, right? Self-revelation, self they are a mirror. So whatever's triggering you, like you said, in, in that movie or that commercial, it's time to go inward and look at yourself. And maybe it's something you're attracting over and over, right? So there's, there's something there in your field that you're attracting these type of relationships. Or maybe it's a question of self-worth or self-value or whatever's happening to, to have that mirror back to you. So I learned that, like you said, that's what I do now. I step back and go, what is this trying to teach me? What is this telling me? What's the lesson here? I think that's incredibly important. And that's the mirror. Now, in my last relationship, I certainly wasn't perfect, but I remember something came up, an episode that was really personal to me that happened in relationship to relationship. And it was obvious to us, right? And when it came up, I said, I'm, I got it under control. I'm going to take care of it, right? So instead of saying, you know, uh, I need you to help me get through this, or I need you to step up, or I need you to understand, it's like, Let's, let me go handle it. I have a council of men. I have a group of men that I go to first. Doesn't mean I don't need your support, but your support looks very different than the support I get from my council. And maybe I have a therapist and maybe I have a mentor, right? Me personally, I go to men first. I don't want to introduce more problems into a relationship. I remember dating a woman uh, in my mid thirties. I was engaged and she was a therapist, PhD. And she became my therapist mm. as well. And in hindsight, I'm like, that was completely unhealthy. I spent hours speaking to her about my issues and she gladly accepted, right? But that's, like you said, what is that, codependence? That's not romance. That's not partnership. That's like mother-son or codependence mm -hmm. or something that I just know isn't healthy, right? So... You get the mirror, you get the realization, and then you go figure out what you got to do with it. And I, I really respect the fact that you brought up you have a council of men. And I've, I've had this conversation with, with both my men's group and my partner around, uh, why do I go to the men first? Mm -hmm. Well, they're going to be mirrors for me who think a lot like me, who are going through something a lot like that, whether it be in your 30s and now I'm 40 and you can you can counsel me on what your experience was in a codependent relationship with a therapist and I love that example because although she is a therapist she can't be your therapist right the story reflected back to me even in this moment of like what would I need to learn in that situation myself mm. and that's why the council of men that I go to I have two different groups one is faith-based and the other one is um, more of like 
masculine feminine energy dynamics and uh and more of a philosophy of what masculinity is for me today and i respect both containers to reflect back at me so that i'm not making my partner bear the emotional weight which is a really bad habit that i know we're not the only two men who have done that <laughs> i don't think so i don't think so and what you know and, and what does that do for romance right it dissolves it like it it, it diminishes it there's no polarity anymore exactly and then you talk about divine masculine and divine feminine and then all of a sudden there's adjustments that happen unconsciously within the relationship and then the woman's got to tap into a more of a masculine energy and she's trying to father the man and the man you know so it's like it becomes confusing whereas i think it's just like thank you sweetheart i want your support i want your love but i got i have help and and men bring a different energy right men are bringing less nurturing energy not, not to say we don't have nurturing energy, but it's more like, hey, dude, you better, you better whip yourself into shape. That's not how you should be acting around your partner, right? That's not the type of behavior that we advocate. That's not the definition of masculinity that we hold as a philosophy in this group. You're better than that, right? That's how men speak to each other. And that's important, you know, because we have so many boys growing up in, in single mother households. They don't have exposure to men. They don't know that communication and they don't have anyone to go to, especially like an elder, right? Which I think is so important. And even if you have a father growing up, if you're lucky enough to have his physical presence, how often is he emotionally present, mm -hmm. right? So this idea of a father is not just the man that gave, you know, that shared his semen with your mother. This is the idea of fathering as a concept. And that could come from any man that's doing the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this conversation comes up a lot in my world because I'm, I'm attracting it. I want to have this conversation of like, how can I be better for myself first, you know, and I'll, I'll go to my council of men. And it actually came up for me professionally today um, in this tumultuous year that we've all been experiencing together, probably the, the largest collective experience in my 40 years of like acknowledging we're all going through the same thing right now. And have we processed that grief, mm. you know, and uh, a client was experiencing some dizziness earlier today and that's new. Okay. What's it trying to tell us? You know, let's adjust some things uh, as a personal trainer. That's my role is like, okay, let's adjust what the plan was because of where you're at today. And uh, the comment back was like, Oh, I'll just power through it. Mm. All right. Now, what are we trying to suppress? as a methodology or a philosophy of just powering through it, you know, suck it up, be a tough, you know, and you, you bring it up and, and why I'm reflecting on it now is that how much was a present father emotionally available to us or how often did they tell us as a, as a group of young boys collectively to, uh, to tough it out, suck it up. Boys don't cry. You know, and the conversation went on from machoism and masculinity, which are two different things, two completely different things. And, and I acknowledge like, Hey, what is this dizziness trying to teach us about your body today, about your experience today? And it eventually came down to this analogy of like, uh, initiating people into swimming in the ocean. Are you going to, are you going to expect them to sink or swim as an experience and as a teaching methodology? Okay, get out there. And if you try to resist the waves, then you're going to get crushed and pummeled into the sand, into the surf. But if you ride the wave, then you're going to be more resilient and able to handle that, that turmoil that's there in the wave. And the analogy came down to the emotions are, or the waves are emotions. And if we resist the emotion or the dizziness or the counsel of other men, we're going to be just bashed into the surf over and over again. But if we ride the information of the emotion, like the wave and we're body surfing, then we're able to be more resilient and adaptable and to show up better in our healthy versions of ourselves. I couldn't have said it better myself, right? I mean, going back to the idea of nature, the analogy that just you just use is perfect, right? I mean, use a stream, use a river, use an ocean, like we're either swimming against the current or we're moving with it. And that current is life. And so many of us, especially men, 
swim against it, but not only do they swim against it, they swim against it alone oh, yeah. in isolation, which is, this is why we have so many issues of suicide, right? Depression, addiction, because men, to your point, uh, I'll power through it. I'm good. I think the, the mantra for men is I'm fine. I said, I'm mm-hmm. fine decades. I wasn't fine, but I didn't even know it. Mm-hmm. And that dizziness, right? Like any symptom that we have in the body is usually a wake up call. It's usually a signal. And that's what I was saying earlier about the body has an intelligence. You listen to it and it's, and it's subtle. It's not always obvious, but it's subtle. And that's why I think silence is so critical. It will tell you what's going on. And, and it might be something as simple as slow down. Mm-hmm. You got to slow down. You're overworked. You're stressed out. That's why you're sick, you know, or, you know, my father's case, it's actually interesting. They came up here for Easter yesterday, my parents, my sister's estranged from my family. She was adopted from Korea. And every so often she comes up, her name comes up, right? And it's a sensitive topic. And my mother's emotional and she'll usually uh, very quickly start crying. And it came up this weekend. And uh, I, I was blown away. Like I knew my, my father had trouble expressing himself emotionally, but now it was like right in my face at a time when I'm more aware of it. And literally, as soon as it came up, he got up and tended to the fire. Literally. Or he's like, Yo, why don't we watch a movie? He would, he would try to like d- detour. Or he would just get up and go outside. He literally could not sit in that conversation and I know that he's not okay with this. I know he's not at peace with it, right? Because this is his daughter. She's been gone for 15 years and she has children and they're grandparents and they can't experience that. But his inability to even discuss it is so common among men. And, it, it, and guess what happens, of course? It gets inherited because my model of a man was my dad. So what did I do for 20, 30 years? I never shed a tear. And I had to go inwardly and really go deep. And now I've cried so much over the last year, I made up for those decades. It needed to come out. I can relate so much to slowing down for the first time in my adult life a, a year ago. And yeah, the tears have come. The, they have flowed freely. And uh, I'm, I'm a part of a men's community for the second time in my life that's not faith-based. So the first one was more like stoic philosophy and based on the way of the superior man and no more Mr. Nice Guy, which are two great works, depending on where you're at in your own journey. Because I've read both books two different times. And the second time for each of those books was how I wanted to feel the first time. But I, I couldn't experience that because of what my central nervous system was telling me was where I needed to look first. Well, first of all, I needed to break down the walls that had been built up of emotional unavailability for 38 years. That's where I needed to start. Okay, break down those walls. And then I can absorb the true message from both of those books. Mm-hmm. And what I hear in your share with about your dad is a central nervous system that's part of, both part of the mind and the body that cannot handle the emotions that come up when a sensitive topic is brought up, like you're a strange sister. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, it's learned behavior, right? You know, they, they've done studies on this boy, you know, male infants are, are not any less sensitive than female infants. In fact, little boys actually cry more, right? So the whole sensitive thing, you know, the whole, don't be a sissy, right? Men aren't sensitive. When I started a men's group, my, my father literally said, a men's group, men don't talk. That was his response to me. Men don't talk. That's what women do. And it's like, really? Because if you look back at history, I mean, there's been tribes of men, like tribalism around masculinity, indoctrination of boys into manhood has happened all over the world. And we got away from it. And now we're living in a society where it's so easy to isolate yourself. It's so easy to play video games and numb yourselves for days at a time, to go on Netflix, to look at pornography, right? So I didn't even know men's groups existed, you know? And I probably would have agreed with my father 10 years ago. Like, yo, I'm not sitting around a circle and talking about my feelings, get the hell out of here. But now you go, oh shit, vulnerability. 
is power, right? Emotional courage is strength. These mm -hmm. are men that I don't want to mess with, even though they're crying, even though they're talking about their childhood, that's power. And we got to be sensitive, right? They were like our words, because like you said, since kids were told boys don't cry, brush it off, right? Don't act like a woman or a little girl. So even words like, oh, you got to awaken the divine feminine and men, you're going to lose a lot of men. Even words like vulnerability, which are usually associated with femininity, scare men off. So I use words like emotional courage. I use words like be an integrated man, balance your yin and yang, right? You have to be a little bit careful because we want to welcome them in. There's a revolution happening, but we got to grab them. And they're so scared because of all of those words and mantras that we used growing up that just are absolutely false. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Integrated such a, such a phenomenal word. And it brings up the Enneagram for me. Had you heard of the Enneagram before uh, yeah. we set up this interview? Okay. Mm -hmm. And as the, as the peacemaker, I've heard it a couple of times so far in our conversation of like, I seek peace. I want peace. And as a leader of men, the peacemaker is such a humble, vulnerable, fluid, flexible leader. Mm. Do those words resonate for you? Absolutely. And then you've got me sitting next to you on the crown of the Enneagram. I'm an eight. Mm. So vulnerability, when you say that word, it puckers me up. You know, I, I get, I have a fear of vulnerability because that means I'll get hurt if I'm vulnerable. Right. So three years ago, maybe three and a half years ago now, I went through a second breakup in six months. And oftentimes it's rock bottom for men that get them to take action. Death or um, a career loss or a relationship ending. And so in order to process what I had been experiencing in the last 37 years, I decided to go to counseling. And then I decided to write about my experience. And it's a... It's a personal training business book with my story built in. So it was the first time that I was being vulnerable in my life, especially my adult life. And I gave it to both my daughter and my, my dad to read as like, okay, it's done. Um, it's 250 pages. Let me know what you think. And, you know, I followed up with my dad a few weeks later because he's an avid reader. He could go through a, a book that short in a few days. So, hey, did you get a chance to uh, take a look at that book? And he goes, it was interesting. What does that tell me? What story does that create in my mind of like, I'm going to take a big leap forward and uh, show vulnerability to my father, who I looked up to for 40, 37 years at the time. I'm going to show vulnerability and what do I get in return? The story that's created in my mind in that moment is that this is not a safe place for me to share that. So maybe six months later, I start the podcast. It's coming up on three year anniversary now. And I meet men along the way who are guides for me, who are reflections and mirrors. And Jeff along the way, he's like, Dave, I want to invite you to a, an, an event coming up downtown Denver. It's close to your place. Why don't you come and meet other guys like you and me? That was my initiation to men's work. And that was probably the best way that you can say it to an eight on the Enneagram is like, Hey, I'm, I'm hosting an event of men just like you and me. I want to invite you. There's no mention of vulnerability. There's no men mention of emotional courage needing to be in that room. But that's what I experienced when I got there. And I stuck around for a year. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's just knowing that there's just this range of personalities, right? And we want to bring all men aboard. And we, gotta be, we just have to be careful with the message. And I love it. It's just, it's very simple. You want to be around other like-minded men, right? Do you have a group of strong men around you? Not really. You want to join one, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's so powerful because, I mean, for me, so what happened with me is I didn't, I didn't have much dialogue with my dad, right? So he's, and he's a great man, by the way. He just wasn't what I would say good at being a man, right? Great, good man, but not great, good at being a man. Um, so I didn't have that. So I was close with my mother. He's an Italian guy from New York City. It's kind of cliche, but I was close with my mother. And as I got older, 
my friends that we go play ball with and all that, like after high school, we went our separate ways. So because I had this connection with my mother, I started becoming really good with women, like really good. You know, like I, I spoke the language. I knew how to attract women and I knew how to keep them around and get them to like me. When I found men's work, you know, late thirties, like you, early forties, really. I was intimidated around these men. I didn't know how to speak that language. You know, I wasn't that guy that could hold court on a, at a table and tell stories like men are so good at doing, right? I, I love sports and all that, but my language was much more seductive. It was, it was much more, I don't, it, I was never manipulative, but it was very, I was very smooth. But being around like real men that have done this work for decades, you know, it was uncomfortable for me. I was quiet and I had to learn this. And now that I learned it, I'm saying, oh, this whole part of me, which is the majority of my energy has been neglected. And now it's awakening. What is mm -hmm. that going to do for me as a, mm -hmm. as a boyfriend or a husband or a father, right? Or a businessman, that's power. Yeah, you touch on something very important of like, when men join a group like that, they have to almost be shown what's in it for them. Mm. And your description of like stepping into that space for the very first time, just like my own, of like, what's, what's in it for me? Like we want to do, we want to resolve, we want to fix what's going on internally. And then we want to get out of there as quickly as we possibly can. And once I was in the room for a while, I understood that that, that strategy wasn't going to work because the men that I was there, my number one reason for joining in the, the first men's group was to build better relationships with men. And that was, I got two relationships out of that group that I would consider both to be, uh, I received what I was looking for. You know, one of them just reached out the other day, even though it's been a year and a half since I've been a part of the group. And he's like, let's do a walk around city park. You know, we don't live too far from each other. And it's an immediate hell yes for me. Mm -hmm. because the language that I learned, the, uh, the authenticity and the integration that I learned by being in a group of men that weren't going to let me get away with my own bullshit was invaluable. And that's what's in it for me now is accountability and consistency and looking at myself in the mirror by speaking to these men who are also mirroring back to me. You know, sure. we do, yeah, we, we do meet once a week. Um, as a group, 10 to 12 guys, you know, and I get the honor of facilitating that group, but simply I just turn on the zoom and we, we go, you know, uh, there's some structure to it and it's very fluid. And, and when you were saying awakening the divine feminine in men, that's how, that's how we're currently doing it is by starting the zoom video, having a little bit of structure in place, and then letting that feminine essence fill the space. Mm -hmm. with what we want to share with each other because we've we've built this deep trust and honor and boundaries and a commitment to one another that is very empowering and very educational and i wanted to ask you a question was there one man that you gravitated to with that energy that made you uncomfortable that you're like i don't care what i'm gonna face when i face it i want to spend more time with that guy hundred percent. My, my first men's group, there was a guy in the group. He, you know, he's 71 now. So he's, this is probably 68. Right. And he is just pointing his finger in the chest of every man that spoke proverbially. Right. And he challenged everybody. And he's like, I don't feel you. And I'm like, who is this guy? He is not scared to speak in front of 20 men and speak his truth. And he is now my mentor and he's been my mentor for multiple years and he changed my life. And I'll tell you, cause you said it earlier, right? You had two breakups in six months. Breakups are hard. Breakups are worse than deaths because there's this, there's always, I, I think I can speak for everybody or most of us. There's always that period where you're like, I may have just, I need to either move on completely or this woman or this guy could be my future spouse. There's like no in between, right? And there's always that decision of, do I fight or do I move on and create space for the next partner, right? 
my last breakup was tough because I met this incredible woman and it was easier because of this council of men. And I went to them and I said, guys, this is where I am. This is how I feel. I don't know if this is my old shit coming up. What do you think? And when you have a consensus of men saying, I'd do the same thing if I were you, these are the same guys that would call you out on your BS. You go, okay, I'm not crazy. This is a healthy decision that I'm making for myself. And at the time, my girlfriend, she was going through some, her own stuff. And she was always that person. And I'm sure some of your listeners could relate where people came to them, to her, right? She was always the helper, mm -hmm. she, but she never had anyone to go to when she was going through something. And I said, where's your group of women? Where's your mentor? Where's your therapist? You can't just harbor all that stuff. You can't figure it out yourself. So it's so important because yes, Robert and Dave are the authority. We trust ourselves first and foremost. However, sometimes we need a check and balance. And when we know that check and balance is super healthy and it's more than just one person, it's not call a friend, it's call your friends, call mm -hmm. your tribe and see what they say. Then you're in good shape. You can navigate through life a lot easier. Yeah, certainly. I'm, I'm chuckling over here because when you said Robert and Dave, I'm like, Robert Glover and David Data. Okay, they're the authorities. <laughs> I'm, I'm not ignoring the parallel here of, uh, of you and I, I'm just chuckling at it. And if we go to our council of men and eight of the 10 of them are saying the same thing, this is what I'm hearing when I hear your story. And if eight of them are seeing through your BS, then that's how um, rising tides raise all ships mm -hmm. of like, okay, that's my council. But I'm not going to, I like how you, I like how you put it in order. I want to make this decision for me. I'm going to put it to the group to help me filter through what's important and what's coming up for me, as opposed to like, Hey, I'm having challenges in my relationship, taking the challenges to the men and letting them decide what my next move is. Uh, the order is very important there. And without learning those mistakes in a group of men, you don't know that that's a mistake. Like now we've had a, a self-reflection, self-revelation -revel after me spending a year in one group and now a year in another group of men who have completely different styles and philosophy and structure, which is important for the masculine to grow. It's important for the feminine to grow. Structure and order produce change. And order is very important. I, I go to my men with like, okay, here's what I've thought of the challenge so far. I'm going to put it to you guys because I can't dominate the entire hour with the whole story of like, here's 30 minutes of my story. Now, now we want to open it up to the other guys. That's, that's not, that's not equitable. Mm -hmm. And you learn these things after experiencing it with a, a safe place and a safe structure to build community and to start to trust that men are not your competition. So true. And that, and that structure, like how many of us grew up with that? right? Like how many of us just do whatever the hell we want. And back in the day, if you as a man made a commitment, let's say that was your word, you'd rather die than go back on your word. And now we live in, we live in a society that's, you know, often flaky. And a lot of that is coming from men. So just being on a men's group and saying every Monday night, you show up on time at seven o'clock. And if you don't show up at seven o'clock and seven oh one, you got to answer to the group and you might have to leave the call, right? Like, when does that ever happen? When would you get that? First of all, none of us are, including myself, are able to hold, hold ourselves accountable to the highest degree. I just won't do it. It's easier to not go to the gym than go to the gym. And I'll find days when I won't go to the gym, right? So having, you know, 10, 20 men on a call going, why are you late? Mm -hmm. Do we need to go over the terms again, right? Go take a mm -hmm. cold shower or drop off the call. It's not how it works here. Mm -hmm. That's powerful because that structure is what we've forgotten. We're not working out in the fields, right? We're not in a tribal setting. We're in an isolated setting where we can do whatever we want and we get instant gratification. That's right. I think the, the only place where it comes up for me to answer your 
That was probably a hypothetical question, but I want to answer it anyways. Is uh, is it work? The the timeliness or the punctuality that we are encouraged, forced to have at work because we can advance our position there. Men are doers. Men are completers. They're builders. Okay, well, at work, there's this structure that you're speaking of, whether it's a female or a male boss. That's the only accountability that we have in our lives. And what, I, what I'm hearing as an experience with the other men is we're all working from home now. You know, oh, well, work used to start at nine. Now it's 9.45 and I finished my breakfast. I'm going to go jump on my computer now. Because we're coming to this realization that we didn't need to spend more time at work to accomplish more stuff. We're almost like more efficient now, but the accountability has gone from here to here. So this self-accountability that I hear you discussing, that I hear you bringing up is who's going to get me to the gym other than myself? Who's going to get me to show up on that group call other than myself? Well, if I'm five minutes late, then there's going to be 12 or 20 other guys down my, not down my throat. Cause that's not what we're doing. We're asking a question of like, what is it about your day, your life, your experience that you couldn't make this call on time? And where else does this show up in your life? Right. It's, it's, and it's that relatability, you know, like, for me, like so someone had, why join a men's group? Like if someone just asked me that, my most simple answer would be like, to know you're not alone, mm. right? Because if I say, uh, I got my heart broken in a relationship, right? It's, and I don't know what to do. And it's like, if the moderator goes, any other, any other guys been there before? And every dude on the call raises their hand. It's like, okay, so I'm going to be okay. And maybe you guys have some tidbits and thoughts and relatable stories that make me feel better because I already feel better. Cause I thought I was the only one that went through this before. And that's huge, right? That's huge because, and it also conversely, if I'm late to a call and 19 other guys are on time, immediately that contrast tells me I'm wrong. I'm off here, right? So, and we don't have that. Cause otherwise if I don't get out of bed, I can say, oh, I didn't get out of bed. You know, no big deal. There's no, there's no comparison. There's, there's no contrast. Having those men in the group shows you exactly where you are. And every man, when they walk into a room, we all do this. We size up the room and we go, where do I stand in this group? You know, some guys will take it to, can I kick everyone's ass here? Or I don't want to mess with that guy. Or it might be something simple. Like these dudes are really alpha guys. They got their stuff together and I need to step it up or I'm going to shy away. You know, immediately where you are, you know, and that's important. Because like you said, we're living in a society where we're working from home. We come and go as we want. We order food, it comes to our house. We don't have to leave our house. So how do we grow when all we're looking at are ourselves? Like you said, there's a time and a place to go inward. But without that group of men, you're going to go slower and you're not going to go as far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing that. That was fucking awesome, actually. Um, when I joined my newest men's group last year and our leader asked for volunteers to facilitate weekly meetings with smaller groups, because there's 300 men in our group and we have one large group call a week and not every man can feel heard by that structure. So we created more structure and he asked for volunteers. And I was like, you know what? I feel as if this time in my life, I could use that self accountability and volunteer to show up and, and cover one of these weekly meetings. Cause guess what? I can't take a week off mm. and I can't show up late cause I'm turning on the zoom call. So earlier I, it was a little tongue in cheek that that's all I do. Well, if all I do for myself is turn on the zoom a minute before everyone else is supposed to be there, then I've done a huge, I've, I've made one huge step forward from where I was a year ago. Of like, oh yeah, I could be a few minutes late. Um, yeah, I'll beat myself up about it for the rest of the day, but yeah, no consequences. Well, guess who I'm letting down if I'm a minute late now? 11 or 12 other men who rely on my structure, my self-accountability. And I think that decision has played a big part in not feeling so, not feeling the opportunity to become isolated. 
I can still go into solitude between the weekly calls and maybe not participate in the thread as often as I used to. That's me in solitude. But I know that I'm not in isolation because I can read through it even if I'm not participating that day. That's huge. Isn't that huge, right? Like just having that support system. It's like having a family, right? I mean, it's just, you have something that you could depend on and you're an integral part of that. You know, like any community, it's, it's so you're stronger with these people around you. And I just, I get, I, I just get a little fearful of the generations that are today and the generations ahead of us where we're moving a little bit away from real connection and finding those bonds. Women seem to have done it better than us over the years. They've always gravitated towards this sort of self-help work and getting together. And I think men are pretty new to it. Like Iron John came out in the early nineties, right? That was like sort of the impetus for men's work. So it's still very young, but I can't think, I mean, I do therapy and it's powerful. But I think the biggest accelerator for me has been men's work, you know, because basically I was just suppressing a part of myself that is my nature. I wasn't, for lack of a better word, nurturing my masculinity. I wasn't allowing it to express itself. I was scared of it, right? Like, for example, my anger, my mentor said to me one time, where's your anger over something that happened? And I said, I don't know, right? And then I went to a bodywork practitioner and he said to me, he was doing Reiki and stuff on me. He goes, you have so much anger in you and so much rage that if it doesn't leave your body, you are going to be dangerous. You're a ticking mm -hmm. time bomb. Mm -hmm. And how many men are walking around with suppressed emotion like that? And they just explode. Mass shootings are all men. I mean, look at the history of the last 350 shootings, all but one were men, right? So the violence we see towards women, it's, what is that from? It's a hurt men that don't know how to express themselves. And when you have a forum to do that, when you have guys that say, hey, buddy, it's okay. Let me, let me model this for you. Mm -hmm. Let me show you why you can still be a man and express yourself. Your life changes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that really resonates. And I want to leave, I want to hear your uh, response to this question. And then we'll leave the audience with this thought of like, for a while, we were taught that anger is the only emotion that we can feel and express and be accepted for. And then there's another time period in our lives, maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but hopefully another man out there will, will resonate with this. And then we're told oh, you can't feel your anger. You can't act like that. You can't show emotion, including anger. What are your thoughts on how detrimental that is or what kind of an impact would that have on a generation of men hearing I that think, conflict? No, it's a great question, Dave. I think it leads to confusion. And confusion is just, it's kind of like what I talked about earlier. When you're in a break, after a breakup, you're like in that period of uh, ambiguity. It's horrible. It's anxious and it's gray and it's uncertain. And for a man, like certainty is very important. Make a decision. You got to go. And all these contradictions and anger is one of them that you pointed out. But there's also many others, right? When you look at the Me Too movement, many men are confused. They're like, wait a minute. I, I thought I was supposed to uh, be persistent. I thought I was supposed to be aggressive. I thought women liked men that went after what they desired, right? And I'm not defending any of these men, but for the men that are healthy, they don't know what to do because they're like, but I thought this was attractive and now I'm hearing it could also be dangerous. So I'm just gonna freeze. I'm not gonna do anything with my anger. I'm not gonna do anything with my sexuality. I'm stepping away from this. So we got to get clear. You know, like you said, the philosophy of masculinity, I don't know if there's one definition, right? But I think it's important for men to sit down and talk about what is healthy masculinity. And sometimes that's going to be personal and sometimes it's going to be more collective. But we shouldn't be apologizing for our sexuality. This is our life force. And take it from a guy that suppressed it for many, many years because of trauma, it killed me. It made me tired, it made me sick, it made me lethargic. 
And when I learned how to release it, I could express it in a healthy way. And we shouldn't be apologetic about it. And we shouldn't be apologetic about our anger, right? And we need to feel like this is, can be accepted by those around us. So to answer your question, I think we just got to get clear, you know, on, on what, what it means to be a man. Yeah, really well said. If, uh, if our audience wants to get a hold of you, uh, check out your book, check out your work, what's the best place for them to do that? Yeah, it's not hard to get in touch with me. I'm, I'm, I'm on all the social media outlets, robertjosephcoaching.com as well. And uh, yeah, please reach out. I mean, even if it's just to have conversations like this, Dave, you know, you know, this is not for me about, this is my life's purpose. So I want to bring more men aboard to be mm -hmm. part of this revolution. So anyone who's curious about this, please reach out. It doesn't even have to be about a coaching session. It could just be about this men's work. I run a men's group as well. There's many out there, depending on your personality. We'll make it happen. All right, man. Thank you so very much for your time. Uh, let's connect again in the next six or 12 months and see where you're at. Hell yeah. Thanks so much, Dave. Really enjoyed it. My pleasure. This. Thank you so very much for tuning into today's episode with Robert Joseph. I hope you enjoyed our conversation as much as I did. And if you know somebody who could benefit from this conversation, please don't hesitate to share this podcast episode with them now. It's available on all podcast platforms. While you're there sharing the episode, please do us a huge favor and leave a five-star rating and a written review so that we can get this podcast episode into the people's ears that need to hear the message today. Don't hesitate to reach out to us on Instagram at The Challenger Podcast. That's where we spend most of our time engaging with our audience and our community. Feel free to ask us a question via direct message. I'm always there to respond. And if you'd like to set up a one-on-one -on -one conversation with me, please don't hesitate to reach out now. Again, this is Dave in Denver, Colorado, wishing you health and happiness wherever you're at in the world.